Josh. I think he died. Well, if he did, I wish he would just tell me so I could continue the <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Everybody, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is our 487th episode being recorded on Valentine's Day 2018. I'm Ryan Shroud. I'm Jeremy Elstrom. <laughs> I'm Josh Walrath. And I'm Alan Valentano. Uh, that's right. We thought we'd get all of our Valentines together for one very special episode. This is where we add all the heart special effects into the uh, yes. into the show. Post Alan process, and I of course. Had a very rom- romantic dinner tonight at Panda Express. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the best. You guys didn't go to. Okay. You didn't end up at uh, White Castle, huh? No, we didn't. They have tablecloths and roses and candle lights and stuff mm-hmm. at uh, Swanky Affair. Is that seriously? Like, yeah, they, they do. That. They do that for Valentine's I, I think Day. they still do that. I know they, they take did. reservations. They, yeah, for they do it. reservations. White Castle <laughs> does reservations on that day. You could, so. you can re- you could oh reserve my. it on an open table. I think it's funny. Like that's something that's not funny in your first or second year relationship. When you're in like your twelfth or thirteenth year of a relationship, that's probably funny, right? You know, because like, I, you know, I was like, hey, you know, I'm gonna do my podcast on Wednesday. She's like, I don't care, right? <laughs> my wife's like, whatever, that's fine. I'm going to bed early. She had to work tomorrow morning. Blah blah blah. Everything's fine. So it works out that way. Uh, welcome to the show, everybody. We will eventually talk about PC hardware. Uh, you can find us. We do record the show live Wednesday nights. 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific at pcper.com slash live. Um, we're also on YouTube and Twitch if you prefer those places individually. Uh, but if you need a gentle reminder, you need an email that we can send you and say, hey, we're going to be live in an hour. Uh, if you go to pcper.com slash subscribe, you get this page here that basically asks for your name, your email address, and we will send you a notification through email because that's how that works. We're not doing push notifications. We're not that... Uh, not that swanky, really. Um, and uh, we'll let you know when we're doing something interesting and or cool. Speaking of interesting and or cool, we have our Patreon campaign continuing to run. That's at patreon.com slash PC per. This is your ability to directly contribute to us if you think the content we do or create or build or whatever is worthwhile to you. Uh, and you think it's worth a buck a month, three bucks a month, five bucks a month, what have you. If you do ad block or, or not, or if you just want to put a smile on our faces or Josh's face or whatever. Um, I was all, as always during this live stream, if you become a new patron and or increase your patronage while we're recording, I will uh, give you a shout out on the show. I check my email, nothing in yet. So I'm counting on you guys. Give me, give me some names to call out. Uh, all right. What does that allow us to do? It allows us to do things like this mailbag featuring our very own Josh Walworth, who is so hot right now. So, so hot. Yeah, very good. Uh, I didn't I didn't watch this episode, Josh. Was it riveting? No. Oh, good salesman. You're really good at this. It's 28 yeah, yeah, minutes. Yeah, That's like yeah, eight minutes over budget. I think it kind of up on the multi-rail thing, multi-rail okay. versus single. I wasn't entirely wrong, but I wasn't entirely right. Did somebody correct so, you in the comments? Well, of course. It's YouTube. <laughs> They would correct you even if it's not correct. I understand. Well, actually, they didn't really correct me. They didn't tell me what I said was wrong. They just said, you're wrong, a-hole. Yeah, that sounds about right. Oh. You know, point taken. Yeah. All right, well, let's jump into the content for this week. We've got a, we've got a little bit to get through. Um, first off, Sebastian posted up a story looking at a preview, and I say preview, of the Snapdragon 845 performance. This is uh, Qualcomm's upcoming high-end flagship mobile processor. It's a preview because we're using a reference design. It looks like that... It actually um, looked. It looks more like a real flagship smartphone than any previous ones where we have come out there to do uh, events with them. Um, it was fairly thin, had kind of you know the normal cameras and sensors on it and whatnot. These are called what do they call them? P- QRDs. QRDs. There you go. Qualcomm reference devices. Um, you can see the spec wise. It has the SDM. Snapdragon mobile platform 845, six gigs of memory. Hey, uh, that name finally makes sense. That yeah, I know. Name. They changed away from MSM, I think. And it wasn't like MSM 945. It was MSM some four-digit number, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's got good 12 meg. Uh, you can see the sensors there in the front and camera. Obviously, the, the testing, we didn't really go over the camera stuff. Um, you get some, some general idea of the specs here. Let's just jump into it. So the performance-wise... The 845 is about 25% faster on single-threaded and about 35% faster on multi-threaded compared to the Snapdragon 835. So that's a significant performance increase uh, gen over gen, year over year, uh, basically to cover both single and multi-threaded situations, right? However, 
That being said, this is again we're just looking at like a Geekbench result. The the I, I, iPhone eight that Sebastian tested with the A11 processor is still significantly faster and single-threaded and still faster and multi-threaded as well. Um, and that's kind of seen throughout the, as we dive into the subsets of these tests in the processor uh, in the CPU front. Um, it's also interesting if you look at, say, you know, integer performance, the 845 is faster than... Um, in, in uh, multi-threaded at least, faster than the 835. It's also faster than the Kirin 960. It's also faster than the A10 Fusion. But in single-threaded performance, the A10, as part of the iPhone 7, is still actually coming in ahead of the Snapdragon 845. Um, again, a more emphasis here, that in, or more indication that Apple has put a significant amount of emphasis on that single-threaded perf. And the same is kind of seen in the, in the floating point shift there as well. Um, memory speed is interesting to look at. The 845 is actually pretty low on this list, but so is the 835 uh, by comparison. If you look at the single multivated kind of memory throughput, um, both the Apple A11 and, and A10, as well as the Huawei uh, Mate 9 that uses the high silicon Kirin 960 um, come in ahead of, uh, of what the 845 is pushing out there. So there's some more tests here in base mark, PC mark, um, and then... The other primary component to look at is GPU, but on the GPU side, the 845 does uh, is more significant increase, right? So if you look at the jump from the 835 to the 845, it's a it's a pretty significant increase here, going from 30 a score of 3500 to 5100, right? So 50 percent, uh, no, not quite that much, but like 40 percent increase. But maybe more importantly, is it does pass the uh, iPhone 8 Plus, right? So the A11 chip in the latest iPhone 8 and iPhone 10. Um, and you go through some of these subsets. Sometimes the Snapdragon is ahead by a little bit of points. Sometimes the um, iPhone is ahead by a few points, but it kind of goes back and forth. But it, essentially, what we've come to the conclusion is that the Snapdragon 845 part is more better, if you will, uh, <laughs> in the graphics side than the CPU side when it comes to catching up with the flagships from Apple. Now, that's pretty much all we we have or that we can talk about now. And, you know, we, I hate doing reviews where we only really have synthetic benchmarks to look at. When you're looking at mobile devices and performance testing, that's kind of what you're limited to. Um, and especially considering that the implementation by the OEM for these devices, you know, what Samsung integrates, what um, uh, LG or HTC or whoever integrates into the devices, how they integrate it is really more important than what these reference devices do because you'll never be able to buy one of these reference devices. You know, like whatever the Pixel XL2, 3, whatever it happens to be, whatever the next Pixel is, if it uses this, you know, those, that's probably as close as you get. But um, it, it's, it's a good sign that the 845 is this much better than the 835 because I th honestly, coming into the 845, having gone through a ton of briefings, with Qualcomm about the 845. They never showed benchmarks. They never showed performance improvements. They kind of just used vague, hey, you know, up to 20% better than last gen or up to 30% better than last gen, um, which, you know, when you're not showing bar graphs and charts next to each other, you start to, enough times you start to wonder like, okay, is this maybe not as good as they were hoping? And so they're trying to keep that out until, out of the conversation to the last possible minute. And it may still be the case that they, are disappointed that they're still behind the Apple processor. But, you know, if nothing else, you're the best of the Android marketplace, which is a huge market, right? Keep in mind that what is Apple total market share? It's under 20%. It's like 18%, 14 or 18%, something like that, mm -hmm. of the total cell phone space. Um, so the rest of that's Android. And if you're the best of the Android, then that's going to be a pretty good, pretty good spot to be in. Um, so that's all I got on the 845. Josh, any thoughts about the what you've seen on the 845 in comparison to anything else or just kind of a wait and see mentality at this point? A little bit of wait and see. Uh, certainly it, it does look like it's going to be nearly class leading, but uh, we have that new Samsung Exynos that's uh, yep. coming out and early indications share pointing to that being even faster. So I wonder if it's going to have better all-around performance uh, than the 845 and, you know, maybe better than the Apple product. Uh, you know, that's, uh, I think, the early leaks, and we'll probably talk about that here next week, is that uh, the Exynos is no joke. Right. 
Yeah, that's always kind of a weird thing for me because the Exynos always appears to do very well, but Samsung splits its own devices between, you know, what Snapdragon and Exynos from generation to generation. So I, I, I'm really curious about why they do that. If it's really just a capacity issue, um, or, or what have you. So, yes, we will. We'll probably talk about that, about that more next week. And I know that they're going to do releases at uh, Mobile World Congress. So we'll see. We'll have we'll have more to talk about at that point too, because we'll probably know again what what regions are going to be divided up on that uh, on that particular chip. The other processor release that came out this week was the Ryzen 5 2400G and the Ryzen 3 2200G. So this is this is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, it's the first desktop parts to come out with the Ryzen 2000 series branding. Uh, it's also the first Ryzen APU, so a Ryzen processor with integrated graphics. We, we saw the mobile stuff earlier, um, but this is the first like desktop variant. Um, and I would say for most for the most part, people this is a longer wait to get this part than we had expected, right? Considering the first Ryzen part was released in March and it's now February of the next year and we're just now kind of getting the APU. And this merges the, the Zen architecture with uh, the Vega graphics architecture onto a single chip. We had to you know, wait for Vega, TM. That's true. Uh, much lower uh, performance than what you have seen in the Kaby Lake G part worth pointing out, right? Kaby Lake G uses a much bigger GPU. The, the Intel CPU and GPU are two separate dies connected on a, on a, on a, you know, MCM package. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, this is one single die. This is your CPU and GPU and memory controller and all that display control, all that stuff in one die, you know, as you would expect an APU to be over the years. Right. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's kind of, like, I don't want to say it's late because it's kind of more or less where they said it was going to be. It just feels late to me in that this is something that has been missing from their portfolio since the release of uh, uh, It of really Ryzen. should have been a pre-holiday season release. Yeah, and, and, and I feel for them because they released so many damn products between March and the end of 2017 that it's almost it would almost be difficult to find a place to squeeze in an additional product release, right? Um uh, yeah. So specs wise, you're looking at the 2400G is a four core eight thread. 2200G is a four core four thread. Clock speeds are are, are right there. You can see them. Um, memory speed is actually spec'd up at 2933. It's an interesting interesting discussion to have because memory is so damn expensive now. Uh, the higher end model has eight compute units and or what is that? 782. Stream processors. The other one has eight compute units and 512 stream processors, uh, both 65 watt TDPs. And then you can see the prices there, 169 and 99. What's interesting here is obviously you've got the Core i5 and Core i3 comparisons. And you also have the Ryzen 5, 1400 and 1200, right? So you go from 1400 to 2400G, you go from 1200 to 2200G. Um, the clock speeds are actually higher, quite a bit higher from the 1200 to the uh, 2200. Um, so not only are you getting the addition of you know, integrated graphics on these parts, but you're also getting better performance at the CPU level from the previous generation, Ryzen 3 and Ryzen 5 parts mm -hmm. of this class, which is which is nice. Um, and actually the price goes down on the 2200G. It goes from 104 MSRP to 99 bucks, um, which is which is kind of kind of impressive. Uh, Ken, you did the testing on this. You wrote the story. No, no. I wrote the story on this. You did the <laughs> testing on this. I mean, sure, I'll take care uh, of it. <laughs> But like, what stood out to you performance-wise on this? Well, actually, before I, before I do that, let me, let me mention this, because this was an interesting spec. This is a 4 plus 0 config rather than a 2 plus 2. If you look at the uh, like the quad-core parts here, the Ryzen 5 and 3, 1200, 1400, they were using two CCXs with two cores enabled on each. Uh -huh. The 2400 and 2200 are using one CCX with all four cores enabled. Oh. So, okay. it's so you don't have to worry about any of that odd stuff with the latency and right. Whatnot. You don't have to worry about like CCX or CCX latency increases, mm -hmm. but you do lose half of the L3 cache because the two plus two gave you eight megs of L3 cache mm, yeah. because the, all the cache was accessible. Here you're only getting four megs of L3 cache. Are you losing memory channels? How does that no, work? it's still two memory, still dual channel memory. Okay. Memory controller is a separate block oh, okay. in, in this in okay. this configuration, right? Um, you know, you also go from. 16 lanes of PCIe to eight lanes 
for discrete add-in, which is not a problem for parts That's, in this class. Yeah, it doesn't. Well, it, not even like. Uh, yeah, I mean, there you, there are arguments that like, hey, if you have a super high-end platform, you have a 1080 Ti. I mean, we tested with a 1080 Ti in our discrete graphics testing, yeah. and it, there didn't really seem to be a bottleneck there. No, I agree. I agree. Um, still uses the same AM4 platform, right? So the same motherboards that were, you know, with uh, 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 the the initial Ryzen release should work in this case. And they have kind of release? a marketing campaign that AMD's been doing with logos. There will be logos on boxes going forward that says they're Ryzen 2000 series compatible, which oh, will help okay. for the releases in the next coming months as well. Got it. Well, and they're already doing BIOS updates for Ryzen 2, so you'd assume with yeah. a flash you should be able to do this. Sure, but how do you flash it? If, if you buy the point. part and suddenly, yeah. yeah. Typical, unless that motherboard is, you know, I, some boards, I assume some Ryzen boards have like BIOS flashback capability, which is, you know, like it started as an Asus feature, you plug in a USB yeah, port. The Gigabyte has a similar feature, but I think they're the only other ones at this point. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, it does, they add, they've upgraded Precision Boost to Precision Boost 2, which is basically more of a, of a declining slope of clock speed as thread count increases as opposed to like a hard shelf. Um, you know, you get the same like free sync features and all that stuff because the GPU integration, it's, it's pretty impressive stuff. There, there's been some talk on the internet communities about HDMI 2.0 support on these boards, like the yeah. B350s and X370s. I haven't had a chance to test it myself because I don't have a 4K 60 hertz monitor on my desk. It's a 25 by 14. Yeah. But like the motherboard... The ports on these motherboards are being advertised as HDMI 1.4, which I think is because of the Bristol Ridge parts didn't support HDMI 2.0. Mm, and it seems okay. that people that are getting these processors and boards are testing HDMI 2.0 working on at least some of them. So you might want to do some Googling around on that. Actually, come to think of it, I I was using HDMI on the 25 by 14 panel over yeah. it, and it, it got full resolution, <laughs> which would mean it was greater than HDMI 1.4. I yep. believe AMD sent us a uh, mini ITX board for this testing two two slot AM4 socket one PCI. This seems like a good platform for this type of, of seems like a good board for this. Yeah, type they're of very platform. smart to send out ITX boards. I was thinking about this before they sent out platforms like, oh, man, it'd be really cool if we uh, got our got a hold of an ITX board to do a small form factor build because, you know, right. you do a really small form factor case if you don't need a graphics card stuck in there. Yep. Yep. Um, so yeah, let, let's, we'll run through, we'll, we'll start with <clears throat> performance to look at like the discrete graphics stuff, because this is kind of the thing that, are, that is, that is uh, really interesting. And you'll notice in these results, we compare the, the new Ryzen 5 2400G to the 2200G, uh, as well as both the Core i5-8400 and the Ryzen 5 1400 with two different discrete cards, the NVIDIA mm -hmm. GT 1030 and the Radeon RX 550. Which are both hover around a hundred dollars right at least when i went to micro center and bought them both they're a hundred dollars you can they, they differ online but yeah that, that that's what we did is we went and bought the two one hundred dollar discrete gpus which are the only gpus you could buy at micro center <laughs> surprisingly enough <laughs> <laughs> um and the idea here was let's see if AMD's claims of having discrete level performance really uh, are accurate in this part. So, and, and you'll see as we look through these tests, you know, Unigen Superposition, Superposition, 3D Mark, um, the RX 550 and the GT 1030 are definitely faster still most of the time, and you know that's that's not totally unexpected. Um, the the integrated graphics on these new Ryzen APUs is about two to three x that of the integrated graphics on the Intel part. Mm -hmm. So it's not even really a close competition, right? Here's Civ 6 at 16 by 9, low settings, uh, 62 frames per second versus 20 frames per second, right? <laughs> one of those is playable and one of those is not. And then if you look at the at the results here, you can see that, that the 2400G is faster than the i5-8400 with the GT1030 and faster than the R5-1400 with the GT1030 as well, whereas the RX-550 is a little bit faster than both. Um, and that's that's kind of a, of, a, of a recurring theme throughout this. One thing to note is all this testing was done at DDR4-2400, yeah. right? And while we understand, you know, I know that the, the memory speed 
<clears throat> the JDEC rating on these parts is actually 2933 improvement, an improvement from uh, all the other Ryzen parts. You know, a lot of the reasoning we went with 2400 to begin with was trying to level set everything. We're going to do a memory scaling story on it later. But also, uh, memory was so expensive that, you know, if you're buying a $140 processor, you're probably not going to spend $200 yeah. on 3,000 megahertz memory. Uh, out, of all yeah. the, out of all of the DDR4 memory, 2400 is pretty commodity. Like, you didn't see 2133 a lot. So you might be able to get your hands on a 2400 kit easier than a 3200 kit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 2933 seeing, kits don't really seem to exist that much in the market. It's either seeing, um, you, you jump up before you get there, I think. Keep seeing 3, and wouldn't it feel kind of weird out. dumping $140 in a processor, uh, $140 on a really good AM4 board, and then more than that put together on your RAM? Yeah, and, and yeah. it's one of those things where you kind of don't have a choice right now. To be fair, right? Memory is expensive no matter what speed you get. That's true. Um, and so there's some market forces at work. And in, in a month, it may be that 2400 is less expensive. Or in a month, maybe 2400 is even more expensive than it is now. Um, and so Ken is finishing up a like the testing for our memory scaling. We're going to look at an IGP performance at 2400, 2933, 3200. Yeah. Like one DIM, two DIM. Yeah. That type of stuff. Spoiler, it, it works how you think it should. It gets faster as the you, memory you speed gets faster. You scaling. Yeah. Integrated graphics are weird like that. Yeah. Uh, from a CPU performance standpoint... Uh, a couple things stand out, right? The the 2200G is faster than the 1200, and the 2400G is faster than the 1400 in almost all instances, uh, and sometimes by a sizable margin, right? Um, what is more complicated is that <sighs> Intel, when they released the Core i5-8400, which is a six-core, six-thread processor, they knew exactly what they were doing, mm -hmm. right? Because... The four core eight thread Ryzen five parts of twenty five hundred G is not going to be able to keep up with that in the vast majority of of our of our testing. Right? Sometimes it's not very far behind, but it's always, you know, it kind of depends. Right? The, the IPC of the Intel cores is better, mm -hmm. and the clock speeds are comparable or a little bit better on the Intel side. It kind of depends. Um, so it doesn't surprise us, right? You look at something like seven zip compression, and you can see here. You know, the 2400G at, is at the bottom here and then the um, uh, 8400 right below it. And, and it's faster across the board in this, in, that, in this particular test. And we kind of see that repeated a little bit. The 2200G is closer to the 8100 in terms of performance, right? So if you look at multi-threaded performance in Sandra, you know, one of those synthetic tests, 90 versus 91 for those two parts. But then if you look at the higher price parts, 119 versus 145. So yep. it's it, it there's a there's a noticeable difference there. Multimedia test, it's kind of uh, uh, a little bit of a of a more which what acceleration methods do you have in your processor? Bandwidth is pretty much the same across there. There's more proof that everything was run at 2400. Um, again, you look at Geekbench, single threaded, 8400 is is winning that by a considerable margin, but when multi-threaded, still the 8400 is 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 clearly kind of the leading part here however however yes there, there's there's a major part of this okay and it's the price yes uh well the 2400g is 169 both of the apus are 20 dollars cheaper than the parts the intel parts we compared them to right and platform and the platform is cheaper. Yeah, you you can only oh run, yeah that's true. You can only run the Intel eight thousand series parts on a on a Z three hundred and seventy board. Right, because Whereas there are no other a, there are no H series yeah. or B series. Those never materialized for for that. And if you're paying less than two hundred bucks for it, it's got everything removed. Yeah, which I mean, the B three hundred and fifty board we used wasn't exactly feature full. Right. Like, I mean, it was an ITX yeah. board. It. It had everything we needed, and there wasn't necessarily anything that I noticed missing, but like you didn't have a lot of USB 3.1 yep. Gen 2 ports or anything like that. Yep. But you can get so much of a cheaper platform, even if you were to buy an X370 board compared to a Z370 board, you're still going to get savings there. Sure. Here's one of the tests where the X26, in the X264 benchmark, like the 2400G is slower in pass two, but faster in pass one, right? So, um, it's it's it was kind of a, a known thing. Although I will, I, I take that back. I will say I'm I was surprised by this because because the Ryzen mobile part 
did so much better than expected in performance testing compared to the, the Intel competition. Um, I kind of just kind of thought for some reason this would be the case. And maybe it was just I forgot that the 8400 was a six core part and not a, a not a four core part. So, and we did some gaming testing with a, with a 1080 Ti as part of this as well, just to see like, hey, you know, 1080p performance has been a problem for Ryzen parts in the past. Nothing really changes in this regard. Um, the 2200, 2400G are still slower than the 8400 and, and, and in general slower than the 8100 for this gaming performance. Um, I think... Also, I you know we should note this too. I know I feel like we've talked about this part for a while. Power consumption is also surprisingly high for these parts. Now this is running Cinebench R15, so the graphics is not um, being you know utilized in this particular test. And Ken it's, forgot to put on the data labels on the chart. Apparently, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> uh, but the 2400G is using you know 115, 110, 115 watts of power compared to the. 1400, which used 80 something, like 82. Yep. Right. So it's a it's a pretty big jump, and it's using more than the 8400, and the 8400 is going to perform better uh, in that particular test. It, it's worth noting as well. this testing was with the internal GPU disabled. Yep. Oh, that's right. Because the the current the firmware is on on the board actually had an issue with having both of them with the discrete having the discrete and the internal enabled at the same time. Windows was freaking out. Okay. So it's not even taking whatever power. It so this is what, what GPU is in this? Was this the 10 ATI? Yeah. Just, it was just idle yeah. during all this. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not a perfect part. It's it's competitive in the CPU space, again, which is better than AMD has been able to say in a long time. Mm -hmm. The GPU, the integrated graphics in this is way better than what Intel provides. Mm -hmm. Not a surprise. Um, and it's very cost competitive. It's especially cost competitive when you compare like, hey, to get comparative or better performance, you would need a GT 1030 or an RX 550 from AMD, right? So you'd have to add another 80 to $100 for a discrete GPU onto the price of that processor. The problem AMD has is they need to convince people that the integrated graphics is good again or is still good, right? Basic gaming, 720p, 1080p, very low, stuff like that. Um, it's it's a tough sell because Intel has been stagnant so long in this space that they've kind of killed off any momentum people had about what you could use integrated graphics yep. for. So, uh, but like I said, the processor stuff's not great. Power power consumption's not great. But it is, I think, important for AMD to address a market that they've never been able to address before. Which I guess I should bring that up. With since then, like think of all. I bet fifty percent or more of the market ships with integrated graphics. Think of all the cheapest OEM PCs you could buy for home, small business, all that stuff. They're all using Intel integrated graphics. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. they're using Intel with the GT1030, and the Ryzen parts couldn't compete in that space. Now they can with this part. So Even if you're not interested in the integrated graphics, at in the current market position of Ryzen processors, you should probably get the 2400G over the R5-1400 because it's only a $10 yeah. price increase. You have the extra clock speed. Mm -hmm. You have the greater memory compatibility. Yep. And you have the ability to plug a monitor in there if you need an extra display that you can't put on your graphics card or you need to troubleshoot something, which True. can be big. Like, let's say you think your GPU is dead. You can just plug it. Like, having internal graphics has advantages beyond using them to drive your system solely. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Josh, any thoughts on uh, on the Ryzen APU? You're muted. That's <laughs> <laughs> just the look on his face. Sorry. There you go. Um, you know, it's it's competitive, you know, at least in terms of just CPU. It's not great. I mean, it's what we expect. Uh, mm -hmm. We did see a little bit of increase just because, you know, the design has been kind of optimized a bit for this as compared to, you know, the, the, the first iteration of Zen. And so you've got some better clock speeds going on there and therefore better performance. Uh, supposedly there's some latency improvements uh, internally there, but you know, I don't know we've, if we've done the, the little, we can't do uh, CCX, CCX testing obviously right. because it's only one That's CCX. That's why I didn't do it. That's why I didn't bother to um, do it because it's like, we don't have like, we know what the number, we know what the number is. Yeah. And I ran it actually. Did you? Okay. Yeah. It was exactly what you'd expect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Josh. I'm yeah. Sorry. So it's uh, you know it's it's it it seems like it's a good product. Sure, it's a little bit hotter and uh, pulls more power than you kind of expect, but it's not bad as compared to what we yeah. previously expected. If you really look at this versus 
the excavator parts, uh, what Bristol Ridge. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a massive jump in overall performance, capabilities, compatibility, all of those things. I mean, Vegas Agreed. pretty good. Um, I'm curious how Vega behind the scenes is when it comes to how is implemented in APU, how is implemented in the Intel Cabby G, and uh, how it is actually done in the uh, graphics cards with the Vega 56 and Vega 64. Um, these are all big, big questions that we have and what's been fine-toothed combed and what's been kind of compromised uh, and, uh, you know, what's what's kind of the worst of the applications that, that we've seen. Um, but overall, this is something that AMD has, has certainly needed. And, uh, yeah, 2017 was stacked full of products, but this would have been nice to have been yep. out a little earlier, hit the holiday season, get some, some product on the shelves. Uh, they probably would have seen a significantly better Q4 than what they did. But um, Q1, they expect to be pretty darn good because I think they're going to ship a lot of these. And, you know, one of the good. biggest parts is that software compatibility of the AMD integrated graphics is so much better than Intel. I mean, Intel's made some some big leaps, but getting game ready drivers that not only work but work at an acceptable level on new games mm-hmm. is asking a lot and AMD's simply on top of it when it comes to this. So, yep. you know, you've got a solid platform. Yeah, we've got a couple of issues with, you know, people with old BIOSes that uh you know need to get that flashed with an old Zen before they can stick in the Zen plus Vega. But other than that, it's it's a really solid marketplace from AMD. Um, it's going to be a popular product. I mean, getting an APU with four cores and eight threads for that price level with decent integrated graphics, that's that's a lot of nice stuff there. Indeed. All right, before we move on to the next story, two Patreons, Christopher J. Turk, edited their pledge from $5 up to $7. Thank you very much, Christopher. And Richard McLaren is a new pledger at $20. Sweet. Thank you. Thank you very much. $20. Guys. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Uh, all right. Uh, real quick. Sebastian posted up a review on Valentine's Day because he loves this case so much. I don't know if that's I don't think that's true actually. Of the NZXT H700i tempered glass ATX mid tower case review, the onslaught of mid tower chassis continue. It's pretty nice looking actually. That's it's a very good shot. Got some of those LED lights going on in there. Very good cable routing. I like the white, um, you know, functional accent if you will. Uh, so this is a. Uh, E, it's what it says it's, so it's an EATX supported case, so a full size ATX case, seven slots, um, three front fans, three top, one rear. Looks like it comes with two fans. He has all the specs listed here for clearances and filters and IO and, and what have you. Um, taking pictures of white cases on white backgrounds, it's a tough job. Yep. It's well, the front job. shot's pretty it's impressive. An art form. This one? Yeah. Yeah. Kinda Where's hides, the case? That contrast kind of hides there, huh? Look at those, <laughs> those bold lines. I like this. The trim around the perimeter of the enclosure is ventilated, which is kind of a nice, uh, you know, way to get additional cool air or either cool air in or hot air out. Hopefully, hot air out because it's not um, uh, filtered air at that point. Clean look at the buttons and USB up top. Um, solid black on the back. Not too bad here. So. I got push button release of the side panels. I still, I like this kind of, uh, uh, the unique characteristics is the raised metal panel of the interior to the right of the motherboard tray. As Sebastian says, I didn't just rattle that off. Um, oops, wrong button there. Good. Seen this in prior cases, H440, S350. It, um, it looks like that the bezel surrounding the front is actually a plenum for the front fans. It is. Oh, I see. Okay. And uh, maybe for the top fans up here as well. So you don't have yes. to worry about the filtration if, as long as you have. Okay, all right, that's good. And it kind of looks neat too. It looks, you know, stylish at the same time. Um, look at that cable routing. That's out of the box. No system in it, but still, it's impressive. <laughs> it's impressive. Uh, top fan mounts. Oh, a torture device. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, or that. So the uh, top fan mounts uh, as the, you know, actually the top panel pops off with a removable bracket, which I think is nice. So you can install your fans and then slide it all back down in at once mm -hmm. and uh, run your, your power cables and whatnot. Um, or you can see here, like that's that's actually super helpful to install yeah. uh, a water cooling kit on there, even an all-in-one where you don't have to worry about contorting your arms and hands up into the right spot and holding things in the right way with one hovering above the other, right? And you kind of place it all down in at the same wow. time. It's pretty nice. Pretty, pretty nice. Uh, let's check out his review on this. He goes through actually the... CAM software, which is their, you know, uh, fan controller and temperature monitoring software. Computer, well. aided, aid, computer aided manufacturing. Yes. Is that it? Monitoring, I'm going to say. Mm. Nice try, though. Where, Can't just was, take an acronym that already exists. <laughs> you can. If, Everyone does. Can. It's can. a cool thing to do now. It's kind of nice. And even, uh, you know, they, they're getting the information from the, uh, uh, I mean, how are they measuring noise? Probably just uh, just estimating based on fan RPMs. Yeah, probably. Okay. All right, I'll accept that. Which makes sense. Like, yeah, you, you yeah. can guess it until you know you install third party fans at all. That's true. Right, yeah. then that number just kind of yeah, then all bets are off. Control your RGBs. Yeah, but that's okay. They're not uh, cam compatible, so that's yeah, yeah, their yeah. fault. Yeah. <laughs> uh, performance on it seems to be pretty good in terms of uh, temperatures. Kind of not a lot of variance here in a lot of the recent designs he's looked at. Noise wise. Um, the quietest of the pack at high performance. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Not too bad. It did get a gold award. It's pricey at 199 bucks. So that's uh that's worth noting. It is a premium case. It does have that um uh a tempered glass, if you will. So uh check out that review. That's the H700i from NZXT. I will admit now that I saw the model number and immediately thought of uh, a Corsair cooler. water cooler. Yeah, oh, like God. a Corsair water cooler of some kind. So, you know, there's that. Uh, all right, next up on the list, Josh has a write-up here on Project Trillium. This is a machine learning product, series of products from yes, ARM, it's, it's right? Three, three products. It's a machine learning CPU processor. Well, I wouldn't call it a CPU, but it's a processor. It's a, an object detection processor and... Neural network software libraries that, that ARM has developed to plug into all these other current applications like TensorFlow, Cafe, and others. So ARM is jumping on the machine learning bandwagon. And obviously they've, they've been planning this for a while. They didn't give us a whole lot of technical details on this. They just said that, hey, we've got this essentially one and a half watt part at, you know, at full speed that can be uh, integrated into uh, premium type phones that can handle that extra um, heat and, and battery load. Uh, we can attach it to this object detection chip that we got from Apical. It's the second generation of theirs. And, and we uh, integrated this in with our software stack so it can be utilized by other third-party applications to do machine learning type stuff. So, um, like I said, they, they, I think that this is probably going to be like a 4x4 four four matrix multiply uh, accumulate type processor, much as we see with NVIDIA and their tensor cores. Um, but it's a uh, it's a neat step in the right direction, I think. And I, you know, and, and let me, you know, bounce this off you. Mm -hmm. Isn't it interesting to have seen technology, especially in computers, have gone from centralized processor to personal computing back to kind of centralized processing and now we're <laughs> going back to personal computing so you had the the micro computer yep. attached to the uh the mainframe and then everybody had a pc and then everybody starts saying hey you know you just need these basic workstations and we got these high-powered blades that you can all share and now we're, we've got more processing being put back into our hands. So if you scroll up here, an example of this would be is you take your, your phone down down uh, Under below the sea? and have it, you know, looking around. And, and, and this is, you know, inputs that are driving a non-existent product that, that – is able to to show on the uh, on the lens of your your dive mask, but it'll recognize certain things like, hey, there's a shark there. Let me 
put on the static around your uh, around your swimsuit. You know, there's a sea anemone. You can only touch it with your gloves. There's a hole here. There could be a uh, it could be a moray eel, and he's going to come out and bite you. And, oh, hey, look at that fish. It's not going to bug you. And plus, you could spear it because it's it's not endangered. <laughs> so Fair. these are things that they want to so put this power wrong back. With this. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> there, there's so many things wrong with this, but we'll yeah, just let it go. We'll let it go. Yeah, well, the diver here is is telling us what what's crap and what's not. Just don't but stick your finger in holes. Oh, <laughs> 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 that's what she said. Fun. Mm. So anyhow, back to this. That we simply, at this point, the companies who do a lot of machine learning do not have the bandwidth going into their centers. They don't have the processing power to be able to handle a lot of the uh, potential requests from users that are driving their cars around, who are, you know, taking videos of something and, and need to see points of interest, stuff that, that requires this machine learning. I mean, it just, it doesn't exist. And so they're putting that power back into people's hands with these low power yet still pretty effective products. And uh, you can easily then attach them to, you know, whatever application or relatively easy. But it again is, is, you know, say you're out of cell coverage and you want to identify something or, you know, you're underwater. You're not going to get a 4G signal. Ugh. These are all things that especially not 5G. you kind of have to worry about. I yeah. mean, self-driving cars, the 4G network goes down, or you go into a uh, dead spot <laughs> and relies on, ah! on you know, central computers driving you, you're, you're in bad shape. <laughs> so you know, this is just moving forward. It's, uh, it's going to be interesting to see uh, the uh, object detection processor is going to be available soon, they said. Um, by mid-year, the uh, machine learning processor is going to be ready, and I would expect some pretty high-end products to come out in the first half of 2019 that will actually utilize these chips and maybe some software. And who knows, maybe sometime by then we'll have kind of a killer app that people really want to have this with. Right. Very cool. Did uh, you ever get a chance to question how they're dealing with some of the research that I've mentioned in the past where, I mean, the one that I just was digging up while you were talking was, uh, so essentially and a 200,000 pixel image, or sorry, 280,000 pixel image, 273 pixel change can make it convinced that that is an airplane and not a shark. We we didn't go into that kind of detail, no, okay. but always the case is, a shark. Uh, second generation neural networks is kind of scary. Yeah, because yeah, it's but, beautiful uh, and it's wonderful if it works, but th- they've just been shown that you know a tiny little thing that's not even visible to a human eye, but you just put like a weird little smeared deco on a car and all of a sudden, oh, it's a banana. Don't worry about it. Always, always, you know, I think it should default to guessing the most dangerous thing. So if it's shark, guess shark. That's what I would. That's what I would say. That man's holding a banana. <laughs> it's a gun. Shoot him. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe don't get well, as we learn, that is the only defense from a man attacking you with a banana. It's all supposed to be Diet Pepsi. Either way. Okay. Either way. Uh, before we move on to the next story, we did get a, a another new patron. Abraham Lincoln has pledged 420. Blaze it? Blaze it. <laughs> <laughs> I believe he was a hemp grower back in the day, wasn't he? Oh, all right. Let's talk about Qualcomm 5G real fast. Uh, Qualcomm had a fairly significant announcement uh, last week, and that they announced 18 OEMs would be building devices based on their 5G, their X50 modem for 2019, and 18 carriers were going to be using their X50 modem technology to test, do like 5G trials, essentially, right? And um, this is all part of it, like, none of this is consumer ready yet. Uh, Qualcomm has stated many times that they believe that 5G networks will be online to some degree and devices will be ready to some degree and available uh, starting at the end of 2018, 2019 for kind of a, a ramp up and, you know, for profit production, I guess is what they would say. Um, and this is kind of their proof of doing it, right? So if you look at the uh, the list of... I I list out all of them, you know, so they include LG, HTC, Sony, Asus, and Vivo. Um, They're going to be using the X50 modem. Samsung is also going to be in that list, although not included in this press release. And they talked about carriers, 
uh, like Verizon, AT&T, uh, China Mobile, others in uh, Asia and Europe as well, all kind of using this technology there. Um, yeah, there they are. Uh, AT&T, US, China Mobile, SK Telecom, all these guys and more, up to 18 in total. Um, the, the emphasis here is that basically Qualcomm wants to prove that they're the leader in this space, that they're not competed that they don't have any strong competition you know they continue to claim that they have a 12 to 24 month lead over competing connectivity providers which basically means intel at this point because intel's the only one making a discrete you know for sale modem i think high silicon's making one but they have never sold to anybody but themselves so there's that basically qualcomm reiterating its uh 5g dominance and capability and then as a follow-up to that is they announced today the Snapdragon X25, I'm sorry, X24 LTE modem, which is, as the name implies, a 4G LTE product, not a 5G product, uh, but supports two gigabits per second. It's a seven nanometer chip, and it, uh, you know, is going to be available in late 2018, mass 2019. And, it, and it's important to note, like, I think there's a lot of confusion, and I had a lot of this as well, is why, why have a... Um, you know, 5G and a, and a 4G kind of like all the, you have these kind of competing announcements and stuff going back and forth. 5G coverage is going to be spotty to say the least when it first starts, right? So you have to have a fallback modem mm -hmm. for some of this. The 4G is going to be that. And in actuality, what they're doing with 5G is these, these phones and these devices are going to be connected to both networks simultaneously. Um, if you remember when the 3G to 4G happened, and I think some older devices still do this. Like when you do a voice call, it reverts back to 3G. And then when you get done with the call, you would hang up and, and you, it, it would, it would up. wait. It would take a few seconds for it to like renegotiate onto the LTE. Yeah, it can only fall back. It can't, right. can't upgrade during the call. So uh, uh, they're preventing that by having both these connected at the same time. You can switch between them basically that seems power efficient. Yeah, there was a lot of questions on that, right? And so these modems will have to be, you know, again... They believe like, hey, building built on seven nanometer helps that. Having a uh, the RF transceiver chip built on fourteen nanometer instead of something larger than it was before will help with some of mm -hmm. that as well. Um, and you know, it makes sense. Like this X twenty four modem will first show up as a discrete part. You know, maybe you'll see it in, in things like their Windows on Snapdragon devices, uh, or you know, third party PCs that integrate it. But then it'll, it will be whatever comes after the Snapdragon eight forty five. I'm sure will have the X twenty four modem in it. So. If you, if you thought one gigabit per second was kind of killer overkill for, for a mobile device, for a mobile device well, two gigabits is there. As we talked about before, it's not about the two gigabit it's per not. second throughput. It's about being able to serve a bunch of people at once. Right. Yeah. It's it's Better. more about capacity yeah. increases, right? And and the faster you can get somebody on and off the network, the better. And then the the these newer modems allow the sharing of spectrum and bandwidth more efficiently. Yeah. So they can less, less the carriers time. can support more people in the same space with the same hardware, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Usually there's a little bit of so. dead space between each slice that each person gets, and you're trying to narrow that. Right. So that, yeah. yeah. Yep. So impressive stuff. Uh and again, I think that makes it the first seven nanometer chip, like officially announced. Like AMD said they were building one at seven nanometer, but didn't give it a name, that type of thing. <laughs> right. And, um I think people, you know. And it's gonna. It's built by TSMC, the only ones with kind of like working seven nanometer exactly today. So, you know, what are you gonna do? There you go. X twenty four, X sixteen, then twenty, then twenty four. All right, let's move through these last ones uh, quicker. If you can help me with it, Jeremy. What a, did Nvidia make money? What's going on here? Money, 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 money. Looks like a guy who's happy. He made some money. I, I always love using that photo. <laughs> uh, so. And this being NVIDIA, of course, so it is the total fiscal earnings for 2018, also known as Q4 2017. Uh, they're up over 40% from this time last year, earning $9.71 billion. Jesus. That's all right. It's, it's not so bad, huh? <laughs> I mean, it didn't hurt that they got a $133 million tax cut uh, that the Nintendo uh, Switch just came out, which is bringing in a bunch of money for them. And arguably it's a little too early to notice that all of the data centers are now paying full price for their GPUs and not uh, gamer class. But overall, it's just all good news for them. They, yeah. They've made a huge amount. Uh, 
just the simply the gaming is 1.74 billion, uh, which includes the Switch. But in the last year, where it's actually been not very compelling to upgrade, that's just impressive. Yep. Josh, any thoughts on the on the finances side? Boy, they're kind of hitting on all cylinders. Um, they've got a lot of their costs under control. I mean, they had almost a billion dollars in net revenue or net income that uh, past quarter <clears throat> on uh, nearly three billion in uh, in revenue. So they uh, they've, they're they're a big company now. They're, I mean, if you kind of look at their revenue versus. AMDs and just GPUs and all he kind of flippantly said we're 10 times the size of our next rival and that's about the truth of it I mean sure AMD has the CPU side that that keeps them up and going and they've got their semi custom that has done very very well for them Mm -hmm. but in terms of actual GPU sold NVIDIA's got them beat hands down I mean it's it's they've got uh, more quadros more Tesla's more gaming cards, and uh, people tend to like them. It'd be nice if AMD were able to, you know, get something a little bit more competitive on the graphics side. I mean, Vega's yeah. not bad, but, you know, it's it's almost double the wattage and heat. Yeah, and, and com- I think it's going to be a while before they can – it's not like next quarter they're going to come out with some new part, AMD, I mean, that's going to – change the competition levels that we see right so yeah, yeah not maybe when the, the side NVIDIA conversation going on in the chat or anything order. oh oh gosh darn it what jeremy, jeremy first jeremy? okay me oh, not to encourage the chat and the the side chat that they're on but one thing nvidia has been heavily investing in is automated driving and automated systems which is something amd doesn't seem to really have gotten into yet and has been paying off for them so hopefully AMD can branch out into that sort of thing as well. Sorry, Josh, continue. Yeah, well, uh, their their uh, their automotive went down a little bit. I think it's like 150 million this quarter. But when you look at how model years go and how they stack up, I mean, it's all and, and, and the announcements they've been making seems like the the revenue increase will be seen in the next fiscal year or two. Like they've made a lot of announcements to be in cars around 2020. So. Like that's going to pay major dividends. Yeah. But hey, years. just think if if uh, Nvidia does have a new generation of cards coming out in the next six months, maybe then you'll at least be able to pick up a Vega for a decent price. Nah. Oh, oh well, yeah, for a week maybe. or two. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> sorry, guys. I, sorry, I'm very very sad and disappointed. It's a very sad Valentine's Day for me again. Kentucky lost the game, and I'm very upset. Aww. What, Auburn? Well, it's a They've been Auburn. losing. I mean, it's our on. fourth loss in a row. Is that the first time with Cal Perry? They've lost uh, four in a row. When we lost last game, boys. When, we, when we lost last game for the third time in a row, that was the first time okay. we'd ever lost three in a row. <laughs> well, that's since the first Calipari time we've lost four here. in a row. Now they're also the first team to have lost <laughs> four in a row since Cal Perry's been here. Womp womp. Oh. Come to the other side of the river. We've got some new, good teams. What's that? Come to the other side of the river. We've got some good teams this year. <laughs> yeah, but nobody cares. <laughs> it's true. Uh, <laughs> uh, MSI AM4 motherboards now support AMD second generation APUs. I think we talked about this a little bit already. Jeremy, is this just BIOS updates? Yes. Uh, and with the Agisa 1.1.0.1 microcode update as well. So it's, it's my favorite worth one. flashing even if you're just running a normal Ryzen. It's my and favorite they went through- update. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, to finish what you were going to say, I'm sorry. I, but as you can see, they've run through just about every single motherboard uh, that they've got going at the moment uh, in the A320s, B350s, and X370s. So, I mean, pop over, get an update. It may help you just basically. It may increase uh, your memory compatibility. And when Ryzen 2 hits the market, you should be able to run it. There's that logo I was referring to earlier. Oh, yes. The, oh, right there here. it is. AMD Ryzen Desktop 2000 ready. Ta-da. Yeah. That seems kind of verbose. Well, I mean, it's I mean, it's got to be like Ryzen. I mean, you could just make it Ryzen 2000 ready. It doesn't have to have the word desktop in it. It just is on a motherboard. Just say 2Gs, yo. It works. Yo, Check shit, out the sweet car works. on the box, though. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, rip off McClary. Uh, maybe if you're buying that motherboard, you could also pick up some 
fast memory from G Skill, 4,700 megahertz Trident Z RGB DDR4 memory, 16 gig kit, uh, two 8 gig modules, um, 4,700 megahertz at 1.45 volts. They apparently did this with, validated it with an MSI Z370 Gaming Pro Carbon AC and Intel i7 Core i7-8700K processor. Uh, it's the first retail kit to hit 4700 megahertz as well as the first memory kit with RGB LEDs to hit that memory speed. Well, if it's the first, it's also the first with RGBs. Hooray. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, did they mention how much this shit costs? Because I bet it well, ain't cheap. So Corsair's 4,600 megahertz is 590 bucks. This is faster and has RGBs. I would definitely put this in your APU system then. Uh, yeah, yeah the, the one that you spent just under 300 bucks <laughs> Get on. Get the 2200G though. Spend 99 yeah. bucks on the processor. Find the yeah. cheapest motherboard. And now. 80 bucks on the motherboard. Yeah. I and saw Bill. 750 on the RAM. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bill, so I did a video about this that I didn't actually watch but what did I say? Uh, the timings are stupid. Like you're really not going to see that much improvement out oh, of the I frequency yeah, because sure. the timings are so ridiculous. Fair enough. All right. Yeah, they're saying 1919, 1939, which is yeah, it's a bit out there. Uh, Radeon Software Adrenaline Edition 1822 released. Um, this was just today. Uh, this one focuses on Kingdom Come Deliverance, Fortnite, and Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. Um, and uh, they're quoting frame rate. Deliverance? They made that into a game? <laughs> <laughs> Probably has the same banjo music in it. Uh, they're quoting frame rate increases of 3 to 4% with this driver, although PUBG can see up to 7% if you compare it to 17.12.1, which is older than the most recent. So I don't know why you would compare it to that one. But anyway, uh, no specific fixes. Um, but yeah, there you go. Uh, the, the fun thing about this is the bug that they cited that Scott points out that there could also also be a system hang that might occur when twelve GPUs are perform performing compute tasks. <laughs> he goes, "I wonder what conditions would cause that." A system hang that See, could no, occur that's when a feature twelve I like. GPUs are computing. Lots of Blender rendering. So, so does it work with eleven? It just dies with twelve. It seems, I mean, I would How do you I would get assume. 12 GPUs in a system? Bifurcation. Lots of PLXs. Yeah. Really? You can actually get 12 in there? I, I thought even like the motherboards that have all the PCIe slots branched out were like 11. And uh, here I thought you were a serious no, I think miner. That B250 <laughs> no, mining didn't. board from Asus is like <laughs> True. 16 plus. It's oh, like really? A, there's like a 16 or 19 slot okay. in mining board. Fair yeah. enough. Now, getting that many of one brand GPUs recognized by the driver at the same time is tricky. Well, I, I think AMD's driver got a lot better about that at some reason, yeah. which is like why this is one of their noted bugs is they're now testing uh, against some of that okay. stuff. NVIDIA's yeah. driver does not. I think it's like, I think eight or I some number close six. to eight is like the max that I don't know. NVIDIA GPUs you can have on one system under Windows. If you Linux, things change. Oh, that's right. On both sides. Linux. And then you can talk to more stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's confusing. Uh, what else do we have? Video LAN, otherwise known as VLC, releases 3.0. Wait, no. Video LAN is the company that makes VLC? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. 3.0 uh, Veterinary. Uh, what are the key new features of this? Anybody? I don't see it. Don't read Discworld, do you? Mm, that's still yeah. around, huh? Wow. All right. All that right. takes you back. Yeah. Uh, adds well. HDR and 360 videos. There you go. They and the update don't work from in the software. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go download it. Otherwise, it's like, no, nope, you got the latest version. Come on, guys. Maybe they just didn't push the updater yet. Extended so support for Blu-ray discs and BD Java menus and overlays. So it, there you go. Uh, it has Chromecast support now. Uh, okay. Which is pretty awesome because getting desktop files to play on a Chromecast was difficult before. You know, like some Chrome add-ins that kind of sucked. Uh they say 8K video decoding, but really they're doing hardware decode of video now. So hardware accelerated decode. Huh. I think they might only be using Intel GPUs for that currently. I don't know if they're doing AMD and NVIDIA. But like Intel UHD graphics 620 supported 8K video decode, I think. Yeah. They were demoing on a notebook. Huh. Interesting. All right. 
Uh, what else we got? Somebody explain this to me. What is the Airtop 2 Inferno? Is it a compact fanless gaming PC featuring a Core i7 7700K and a GTX 1080? Or is it a fireplace? That picture is really bad. That Photoshop is really bad because I cannot tell if that's the scale or not. You think that's a Photoshop? It's a rendering. Yeah, is it? Yeah. Okay. Well, here's another one. <laughs> and it's actually a, a, okay, a so 16 it's, inch monitor. It is actually it is actually a lot bigger than I thought. They're now looking at the ports. Um, it's deceiving. Yeah, because it's like just the shape of the case kind of yeah, tricks you into thinking it's smaller than it yeah, is. Yeah, agreed, agreed. So maybe that is not a Photoshop, which is weird lighting. This is a big case. So I, I, at first, I was really confused that they could fit a 1080 and all that in, in this. Not confused, but impressed that they could fit that all in there. Um, but no, uh, now I'm it makes more sense. Yeah, looks like that would fit. Yeah, no twenty five hundred dollars starting at. I guess. Well, that's the workstation version they apparently already have out with oh, Xeons and Quadros, but they're, I think they're crowdfunding the mm. more gaming focused okay. one. It's a good exploded view, if nothing else. Yeah. So the whole stick with this is that it's fanless. Yeah. Yo, dog. I that's a lot like of power to, to get out of there fanless, but okay. Well, I mean, the, the whole case Do not is touch the system while it is running. Yeah. <laughs> Fair. I, if they can cram all that and have it fully passively cooled, that's it's pretty awesome. It's going to do some throttling. Well, I'm sorry. Can you speak up? I can't hear you over here. I, I, I think it might do some throttling. No, really. You're not coming through my earphones. Think it might I don't, throttle? I don't ever come through oh, your okay. earphones. Got it. <laughs> uh, so that's interesting. Sebastian posted that up today. The Airtop 2 Inferno. It's got a cool name, if nothing else. Inferno, because that, that's uh, how hot it will be. the surface area, though. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot there. And it, because it's bigger than I thought it was, that makes a little bit more sense. But how much does it weigh? It's going to be heavy as F. <laughs> it's yeah. be really heavy. You're right. It's, it better be really heavy. <laughs> Solid copper all the way down. You can game for an hour. <laughs> it, it's not even dissipating the heat. It just is collecting it. <laughs> it's just you can warming brand up. your children if they walk by. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Finally. Wait, what? <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure I want to get to your pick, Ryan. That's just scary. Oh, we're going to do it. So here we go. Let's get into it. Hardware, software, picks of the week. Here's mine, everybody. Absolute waterproof medical tape. For your ears? Yeah, but you're not using it for medical purposes. For my ears. That's right. What? what? So here's this medical tape, right? And then uh, switch off here for a second so I can find the right tab. And the reason you do this is so that you can finally fix... Your ears aren't that big, Ryan. It's Your okay. Your AirPods. Oh, so you've put little... So there is... there is. I had an issue with my these AirPods that I have. The one on my right ear would fit fine. The one on my left ear was always loose. You made and medical? I was always afraid it was going to fall. Like, if I took my jacket off and I kind of brushed it by yeah, it my ear, it, it would ear. knock the left one out, but not the right one. So the hack I found was you take that medical tape and you hole punch it. You use a hole okay. punch, take out one piece, and then you stick it to the edges of the... AirPod, uh -huh. and there you go. You have created medical tape rubber nubbins. Yeah, essentially. They're okay. flatter. Yes. Um, and they're medical, so it's good to pee on your did body. You, did you do that to both? Yeah, I did. No, I did it to both because I figured why not. And the benefit here is like there, people sell accessories that do this, like little rubber um, so fittings around, around it, right? Yeah. But the problem is uh, you have to take the – most people say you have to take them off to get them inside the case. Right. Which is really dumb. Oh yeah. So this you don't have to do that. They still fit inside the case. Yeah. And uh, whatever. And and they it works amazingly. Sweet. Now I mean it saves you from having some sort of retention device that might directly attach the earphones to an, an anchor. You have to take that off too just to get it in the case. Would stop charge. them from falling out. Yeah, and you'd have to take well, that know, off. You could every time you charge them as well. Yeah. You could just get a big roll of Coban and wrap it around your neck three times. <laughs> You could just stay right true. in. You could just take that roll of medical tape and just take like a two inch strip and put the AirPod in and just slap Smash. the tape over your ear. <laughs> <laughs> just it all well, had like spot. three rolls of the medical tape accidentally well, for Amazon. So I didn't realize so. this particular listing, which is the one I bought, says pack of two. So now I use literally an inch and a half of the tape <laughs> to make four hole punches, and I have two rolls of uh, absolute waterproof medical tape, 180 inches long each. So you know, yeah, safety you got a young first daughter, in all it. other instances, but uh, you know. 
Now you there can, you go. If, if, if only you sold for $5, a few of those will just sit there and hole punch the crap out of that thing and just... Hey, you know, if, if you ever had the swimming diapers fall off, these will fix that and yep. stay waterproof. So, <laughs> wait, do you wear swim diapers? No, but I'm thinking your daughter does. Oh, oh, I see. I see. How do you how, tape, how do you them tape on. a di- diaper on? Around the Just waist? like you like go a, like around, around, it? around the legs and, and next thing you know, you pull her out of the pool and then she's, she's just holding water. She's still swimming and something. <laughs> I figure I mean, there's if water she poops inside, in the pool, that's somebody else's problem, right? Like, that's that's not just, it. Just just say it's a baby brew. That's true. Uh Technoscope says in the chat, you don't need to order it. If you just send me a self-addressed stamp envelope, I will <laughs> Ship you a strip of uh, of Next Care Absolute Waterproof Tape. Josh Tech branded, ten ninety nine. That's right. I'll even autograph it for you. How do you autograph the tape? Sign it, and just don't hole punch that side. Yeah. I mean, you won't be able to use the autograph on the earpod. Little RS initials on the little hole punched sections. You know. Oh, challenge accepted. There. All right. So, Alan, what do you got? So we're a much better solution than medical tape. What? Yeah. yeah. Uh, when we were at CES, uh, I passed by the shore booth. It happened to be yeah, like weird. In, the, in the back it's a nine. Coincidence. Yeah. It's weird. Um, well, I have shore your boats. I wanted to see what they had. It was so weird. It's uh, uh, just passed by it. Yeah, just passed by it. So they had these. Um, <laughs> they're finally making a Bluetooth like adapter cable for their earbuds. The shore earbuds have like interchangeable. Cables, wait, 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 wait. Right. Bluetooth adapter cable. Well, what's you need a cable to yes. get to the two. Okay. So you don't have to glue them to your ears. They're, they're yeah. socketed on the earbud side on those headphones. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so um, uh, you would think they're pricey because that Bluetooth cable is 100 bucks. However, alternatives before this that have not sucked have cost between like two and 300 bucks. So oh. that's actually kind of a deal. And the amp is supposed to be like, you know, designed to drive short earbuds specifically is the idea. So... You know, the sound should be better. Uh, What I don't like about the other two new products they also listed is they finally have like a lightning cable and like a, um, I think there's even a USB-C version, which uh, may not be listed yet. Okay. Um, However, those cables are not wireless. They're just cables with either a lightning or a USB-C end on them. Mm -hmm. Those are also $100, which makes no sense to me at all. Because even the knockoff versions of those cables, which you can get for like 10 bucks on eBay, are actually, like, I can't even hear the difference between, you know, driving them through the adapter from the iPhone or going through the, like, a native, like, lightning connector huh. cable, right? So, yeah, I don't know what the deal is with those other ones, but the Bluetooth one looks like, uh, you know, it might be interesting to some people if you have uh, any of those earbuds that have, can you remember the name of that connector? No. It's like some weird four-letter acronym of a connector. It's like these really tiny... It's almost like the antenna connectors on like Proprietary laptop. Proprietary and expensive is what I would call it. Well, but, you know. there's other... It's not just Shure that uses those connectors on their earbuds. There's other brands that also do that. Um, the cable on that looks really long. Like, on the what Bluetooth do you do with one? all that cable? No, it's because it's, it's a large... It's what like zoomed in. What do with all that cable? It's all really just cable. like as if it was one of those just dongle things that kind of like... It's almost like a little necklace. Yeah, it's right? got a mic there's on a, it. There's too. a battery in the in the center that just yeah. hangs in the center, um, and, okay. and, and that's where yeah. the amp is as that well. That does look a little long. It's like down to the middle of her back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or to it's pound on long, your back but... while you're running on a treadmill. Boom, boom. boom. See, like you notice that when she was you running here, need some here, medical tape to tape down the yes, Bluetooth yes, transmitter to your. Tape. There you go. She's either running very slowly or that's very heavy because it wasn't bouncing at all. But it has the, like the the. Amp slash Bluetooth slash battery section or whatever guy. sits in the middle, and then it still has the separate little piece on the side that has the volume buttons yeah, and the microphone. It does seem really long, though. I don't know. Maybe that's maybe they people decide they'd rather have it hitting their back than the back of their neck while they're running. The mm. idea you're supposed to be able to do either front or back. Yeah. Well, you can do it with all of those headphones. Yeah. Words. Duct tape. I don't know. Might be worth looking Gaff into tape. for for medical those tape. That. Medical tape. Uh, yeah. Medical tape doesn't work that well for that. Hole punch it. Hole punch. Yeah. And then do <laughs> you it. Got a hole punch it. For yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, who's up next? Who's got the register, register story? Is that Jeremy? And genie equals one. And so now if you've got a, a, a next router, it, it may actually be logged <laughs> into the admin page right now. Uh, cause it's literally that disgustingly obnoxious. 
So if you're running a Netgear oh, router, man. please go out and patch the damn thing because literally adding ampersand genie equals one to the login URL gets you in with full admin rights. I don't want to be on this that's internet anymore. Not an issue Ooh. and there's, there's a fun little script you can run if you don't have the newest patch that puts it back after you repatched it awesome nice. so yeah if you're running a netgear router you're like please go to the website look for a new updated uh firmware and just do it maybe we should use uh the uh, medical tape as a thermal interface material i give it a shot it's a good idea yeah see how it works all right, last but not least, Josh, did you just link me to a page? Did I? I think you did. He's starting to get a new egg. And it's the Samsung C49 HG9049 inch. Yep, I got it now. Go for it. Say it. Word it. Um, so, yeah, 600 bucks off this. It's what? The uh, QLED. FreeSync 2, one of the few, few ones out there. I don't understand this. It's only, you know, it's 1080 vertical, but uh, yeah. 3840 is, is damn near Ifinity slash surround. Damn near. And the, so the, and the, housing, curved. the housing is not white, might I add. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm like colorblind. What's it got to do with anything? Because yeah. all of the other Samsung... Uh, Look how white that is. All the other Samsung computer displays. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, they tend to come white. Yeah. That's Except for like this model of yeah. that range. Here's what I don't get. Uh, I don't know anything about this monitor. Haven't tested it. No clue. Um, it's FreeSync 2. Why hasn't AMD sent these out? Or even no. said anything about them? Because nobody's actually got uh, Vega cards. No, that that's can run BS because I do. Why haven't they sent these out to like out our butt. review? Why? Why have? Yeah, we've got so many bigger. Well, in other words, why aren't they excited about this monitor? Right. This, I don't know. That bothers me. What do you do with the four ninety nine inch monitor? Ask AMD. You Maybe put it they on your Samsung on your have desktop. very bad relationship. But seriously, what do you do with a forty nine inch monitor? Forty nine inch. I would dang replace my three inches. I think it would still be that's, too large for that's that. That's really long. You get football guys to fly out of it. Ooh, <laughs> blue, red. <laughs> I don't it, think they're playing football. <laughs> <laughs> when the display gets that that wide, you start running into problems with like where to put your speakers and stuff on your desk. Underneath? No, I don't. No, underneath. I've got three monitors. I'd love Man, to look get at the one difference in hertz. Good one. So good. Yeah, but what's what's the diagonal of all of your monitors? I bet it's less than forty nine inches. No, still. it's probably more. Than uh, inches. I've no, got mine would be if I had them in landscape mode. So if you know geometry, you I could probably figure that I out. I don't know geometry. Tokatoa. Yeah. I'm A squared plus B squared equals C squared. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Pretty much. Yeah, I, I think that monitor is no, pretty 21 much. 21 inches, if I put them in uh, landscape, would be about that size. I would like to see okay. this. But yeah, I, I just have HDR, I, 144 hertz refresh. That's, that's I cool. do. I worry that the HDR is not good though. It probably is that, not good. That, yeah, that's that's kind of because we got an LG HDR. We got an LG FreeSync two monitor in. It right? wasn't FreeSync two. Well, I think it was. But was it QLED? I don't think it was. Yeah, Does it have quantum no, it wasn't. dots? It was. It was LG. Yeah, because that'll help with color depth a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It but will. like, it was HDR, and we used it. And we're like, this is bad. This is really bad. Like, we didn't even review it. We sent it back. It's like, God, this is really bad. You should do this again. Do this over. <laughs> you should not. You should, you should not, not do sell this. this thing. You should not do it's that. Not, yeah. All right, everybody. That's going to be it. Well, for hey, this. hey, there, oh, there could oh, be a reason. Oh. Yeah. It's six hundred dollars off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that's also kind of a of a tip. Or maybe it's just because nobody freaking knows about the thing. That, that's and also just possible. Not selling, like you know, it's possible. Hence the whole like, if you didn't tell anybody, like, hey, we got this monitor. Yeah. Like AMD even telling, not Samsung's job to to say it. Because I think Samsung announced this panel a long time ago. They did, yes. I think it was like with the Vega release or something. Yeah, and I think it was that panel Maybe before that. I think it was that panel, and there were two other ones that were that had the white white housings to them. Sure, that were combined see, with that see, one. I, I don't know. Like, if you're in the market for this wide of a monitor, where you have a full, you know, a full desktop wide monitor, because that's pretty much the width of a full desk there. 
you're probably going to be better served by a standard view primary and two portraits on the side. Because you can get that no. nice no. portrait view. Wait, you no. want a portrait view because you're a programmer. Uh, I'm okay, tired you're right. of uh, basils, no. damn it. Tired of them. That's, that's true. What Give you need is some thing. software to create virtual monitors <laughs> inside your one single monitor space. Whoa. What? Now, now whatever happened to that? That was the thing. NVIDIA had that as part of their driver, where you could like create yeah. regions and full screen to that region. No, no, no. Whatever happened to the, the things you could do back like Windows 98 or 95 days with some of the like the Matrox drivers or something, where you could just have a resolution higher than what your panel did natively. Yeah, virtual and you just desktops. just drag the mouse to the edge and it would just, it would pan, Scroll. it would pan the desktop around. Well, now yeah. Windows has multiple desktops built into it. Like, what is it? Control, Windows, left yeah. and right arrow. But that, oh, but that never replaces used it. I use that. I've actually used that before. Oh. On my laptop, not on my desktop where I have multiple displays, yeah. but on my laptop where I have like one browser open with like research and yeah. one, and then I, the other one will have like two Word docs open side by side, one with my outline, one with the, the writing on it. Yeah. I'll, I'll switch between those. That's, that's swapping your desktop one. I always feel like I'm cheating on Linus when I do that though. Like this was, <laughs> this thing was like an infinite or whatever scrolling desktop. You could like, you yeah. could have two screens wide worth, and you just kind of drag over to the other one, and everything. Yeah, it doesn't over. seem as useful. No, Ma Ma Matrox yeah, had it now. for a long time, and actually, it was it was part of X11 for a long time as well. Um, it sounded good Until in you theory. Tried to use it. In practice, it was just it's terrible. It yeah. is so bad. Yeah, there you oh. go. Yeah. All right, everybody, that's it oh. for re what? Oh, I, I was going to say what? back to Josh's point about the widescreen. That would be amazing for gaming. No if the one. games support that it, resolution, it does. that's true. And the yeah. problem, the problem oh, is, they do nowadays. But they do, but they fisheye it still, right? Well, in, in games I mean, where Flawless you can't, widescreen helps a bit. Uh, there's a little program. Yeah, can, but, but if the application, if the game doesn't bit. support FOV adjustments, yeah, it stretches the crap out of you. The, got the, nothing. The and edges. even at 120, it's still yeah. Things are closer than they appear. That's, that's my on all, the sides. All, all the magic of Ifinity and Nvidia Surround and all that crap. Never came to fruition because I feel like the fisheye effect on these things screwed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And they never fixed it. And develop no, I don't want to say no, but no developers or games that I know of really took it seriously and, and did it dirt, like the right rally. way. It's tricky to fix it because you they have did it to... without fisheye. Well, Correct. driving games won the driving games, too. Look, driving games look great in, in Infinity, but in FPS. Kind of like, yeah, like garbage. Yeah. Uh, no, it stretches badly. Like I understand the multiplayer concerns with that. Right. It's kind of like you can see yeah. you so much more and you're cheating or whatever. But for like single player, just let me do that. Part of the problem <laughs> part of the problem with a single panel being super wide and the way that games games will typically try to render their scene is it's just like with the foveated rendering stuff. Like a regular mm -hmm. game just has a single projection that it's doing. It's mm -hmm. assuming you have a flat, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, a flat surface looking in one particular direction and you're looking through that that window. Basically, right, and that's what it's drawing on the screen. If anything, games aren't even they're not even compensating for the fact that we have now curved panels. Games aren't projecting, right? You know, doing a curved projection to compensate for that, right? Either so, the wide, the more ultra wide you go, the better the chance that your games are just going to distort like crazy. And you're actually better off with a driving game to have like Josh's setup, which is where he has three panels, because games that are aware of that will just do three projections, and his side panels will look. You know, like you're actually looking out the side of the car, not that mm -hmm, you're looking mm -hmm. at trees that are 10 feet wide. Right? <laughs> Fair. Yeah. Uh, and make sure everybody, if you are in the chat, you go click on uh, Anthony's tweet so you can see the Valentine's Day uh, movie poster that he made for us. <laughs> so I think that's very important for everybody to do. I, I don't have, I'm not going to bring it up here. I just don't. They can't do it right now. But that's it. That's it for the episode, guys. Thanks for joining us. PCPro.com slash podcast. Go there. Find this episode, all the previous episodes, show notes, links, uh, RSS subscriptions, Patreon links, all that stuff. Uh, big thanks, everybody, for hanging out and joining us. We'll be back next week. It won't be as exciting because it won't be Valentine's Day. But we'll be back. Thanks, everybody. Bye.